Hi, I'm Saad Nasser. I'm a co-founder of Ati Motors. We are creating an autonomous cargo vehicle which is designed from the ground up to uh, be to for uh, computer control. So it's it's a three-wheel vehicle which carries a hundred kgs of cargo. It uh, it's a two the two front wheels are actually the front of the vehicle, and the rear wheel uh, has an interesting arrangement where it can turn up to ninety degrees, and the vehicle can turn in place. This is a vehicle designed specifically for machine control, and we use uh, machine learning and deep learning a lot in our autonomy stack, and this talk will cover uh, where we use it. For example, we use uh, CNNs for vision and, uh, and other technologies. We use uh, reinforcement learning for driving policy. And this talk will also go over the various uh, challenges we faced uh, uh, around data collection, how we use simulators and transfer learning, and the various engineering challenges we faced actually converting this whole thing uh, to run on the vehicle. If you think about it, there are a few definitions for uh, what autonomy is. In our case, it's getting from point A to point B in some uh, some environment like uh, like a private campus, a large private campus. And uh, the most important thing to navigate in such environments is, firstly, you just need to know where you are and how to get to the point. That is, you need a map and it's crucial to know where you are because if you don't know where you are, you don't know you can't really go there. And you need a map with, because that tells you how to go there. Once you've decided uh, what you're going to do uh, on this map, like you're going to go on the road or you're going to take a turn, then you need to actually perceive uh, all the obstacles around you. You need to uh, figure out this is my this is my vehicle and there's this road and I have to stay on the road and there are these various obstacles which I should not hit. After you have achieved, uh, actually perceived the environment around you, you have to have some policy on what you're going to do. So for example, if you have a stoplight, what do you do? That is a perfect example of policy. And you need to decide when are you going to stop, what, uh, what do you do at an orange light. What, for example, you may do different things based on whether you've already crossed the line. And after you, your policy actually gives you some action to do. There's some controller at the bottom that will actually uh, control the vehicle. So if you think about it, there are a lot of existing te te uh, technologies for vision. So listed here are some very popular networks like ImageNet and YOLO and all of these. And these, these are uh, good for actually taking in like an image and outputting segmented out outputting various outputs. While uh, there have been a lot of attempts to actually take one of these networks as is and uh, actually just use them, that doesn't work because a lot of these networks, if you take ImageNet for example, they are not really designed for autonomous driving as such. So for example, uh, ImageNet has a lot of classes. For example, we probably don't care about the specific uh, for example, if you detect a cat, we probably don't care about what type of cat it is. It's more that it's a cat or even more generally that it's an animal. And some of the other te te techniques, ha and on top of this, we also uh, use non-deep uh, learning me methods. So we still use, for example, if you have a, or on a highway and you want to detect lanes, then the who transforms are still the easiest way to figure out uh, what the road area is. We, uh, for our own vision, we are making our we may, uh, are making our own approach using a mix of all of these networks, and we are now evaluating how these networks will uh, fit into our uh, our autonomy stack. So, if you think about it, one of the most important things in an autonomous vehicle is to figure out where the road is. If you don't know where the road is, then you can't drive. Uh, uh, some of you may have heard of segmentation. So segmentation is uh, usually done using an autoencoder based network. So you have a network where you take an image and then you output something like this. So green for example is the road. And you can see it's done a pretty good job. This is an image taken uh, outside our office in uh, Malaysia. So you can see the network did a pretty good job of estimating the complete road area. 
they it they do well in certain areas so you can see uh, near the uh, bottom right side of the image it's not uh, realize some a road is actually road and a few other things so segmentation is important because a lot of networks will happily give you a bounding box but for things like roads they aren't really any bounding boxes for example there's no line per se in this road for example there's a scooter so that definitely is not a drivable area so if you just uh, push two lines and connected them that wouldn't work we also need to detect obstacles so for example this is uh, YOLO running on the same image. So here you can see uh, these networks sometimes have errors. You can see the purple box. So uh, these networks usually do need to be uh, trained. For example, this particular network, if you show it image of a car, it may sometimes actually detect people inside the car. And that is good, but we probably don't care too much about things inside the car, for example. So we can, uh, we need to we need to train the networks so that the, these things are handled. There, there are a lot of er errors you encounter when you apply uh, these off-the-shelf networks to our, uh, the, our specific problems. So, and we do fit, we will fit these to our needs. But you can't start from scratch because these net, because these data sets are huge and it takes a long time to train. Another interesting uh, thing is, the, you can see here you get 2D bounding boxes. But finally you want to drive a vehicle, so you really need to know what the obstacles are like in a 3D uh, space. So for example, you need to figure out that this car is also deep, so there's like a 3D, in 3D space it occupies some space. So that, that's another uh, thing. Finally, once you put all these things together, you get a map of the area around you. Once you do have it, you need to uh, actually use policy. So for example, take this intersection. If you are, uh, there's just, if you think about all the possible things you can do, there are like few hundred uh, things you could do, but not all of them are legal. And uh, yeah, and in some cases, even if it is legal, you may not want to do it. So you need to actually decide what you do. For example, if you want to take a U-turn, you will go into the turning lane. Or if you uh, want to take a right turn, you'll stick to right lane. These are, uh, the this is a sort of thing that uh, reinforcement learning is very uh, good at because in a lot of cases uh, sometimes making errors is not really dangerous. It may just mean you are you slow down or things like that. Though in some cases the, the problem with reinforcement learning is even the very simple things like stopping at a red light uh, need to be trained and sometimes it will just randomly uh, not go at a red light. So you do need some way of generating uh, scenarios for uh, reinforcement learning and in general any uh, uh, even other vision stuff. So for example if we go and go ahead and collect a lot of data you will get you will get a lot of data but you won't get data about edge cases for example if you wanted a very specific type of dangerous event or a crash or something you can't really reproduce it or get data on it. So for that we have developed our own uh, simulator. So here you can actually see uh, in the simulator, th this is our vehicle and you can actually uh, run a script that which provides inputs into the, to the vehicle and then you can actually drive it around and you can even add other vehicles and test various uh, edge case scenarios. This is very important because if you think about it, you uh, the difficult part about driving is not the um, the uh, generic scenarios, but the very speci very specific scenarios that you rarely get. For example, an, another driver behaving in an erratic way, or uh, or these edge case scenarios like crashes. And you, for for one, you cannot create them even in a control environment. And it's just that uh, making errors in a simulator is a lot less worse. And simulators can be paralyzed like any other uh, program. So we, ha we face quite a few in challenges actually putting these on because you, these have to run on a vehicle. So we face quite a few challenges actually putting these on the vehicle. So if you think about it, on the vehicle you first have uh, simple hardware issues like you have to synchronize all your sensors because if you don't 
for, so if you think about it, we have a lot of sensors. We have a lidar. We have a camera. We have cameras. Uh, we have uh, we have radars. We even have some other uh, cameras like IMUs and other things. And you, uh, for, first of all, you need to sync all of these because if you want to do driving, uh, timing is very important. Because for example, you can't predict how fast the person is moving unless you have accurate time base to calculate that. Another interesting fact uh, some of you may have heard of is if you have a camera, most cameras are rolling shutter. So if I take a photo, the topmost line of the camera is captured at time t and the uh, lines successively below that are captured at different time intervals. So if you actually are moving and you take a photo, you will get really bad distortion because this is not one uh, instant in time, it's actually a rolling uh, shutter. So you need a global shutter for example if you want to do uh, CNNs and other stuff on a moving vehicle. Another important thing is uh, just mounting because once you have the camera you actually want to calculate where a person is. And the way you do this is you, for example you just use uh, heuristics. For example you know a person is roughly this wide or something and then you know where your camera is mounted. And then you can calculate using various uh, approaches because you have multiple cameras. But mounting is a rather important thing because first of all you need to mount it very accurately because even slight variations in where your camera is mounted could result uh, in larger variations because cameras are uh, devices where li like that. You also need to calibrate your cameras because what can happen is even two, uh, even two exactly same uh, two cameras of the same model can be significantly different in the, their performance and characteristics. Another important thing is uh, detection. So we, uh, since we are a vehicle, we require real-time detection. So if you want to, uh, run, so 30 FPS, which is roughly 33 milliseconds. So you need to run your whole uh, loop in 33 milliseconds. So if you think about it, most networks take a lot longer. For example, ImageNet the execution times are measured in seconds on uh, high-end GPUs like the ones we, we use in our servers. So there are various ways people actually do detection at higher uh, FPS. For we for example, we uh, have uh, a method where we, so for example, uh, one thing you, uh, off the shelf networks do not exploit is the fact that you have temporal data. So you don't necessarily have to on look at each uh, frame as a completely different thing because it's a video. For, for example, if something was a cat in the previous frame, it's very likely it's going to stay that in the next frame. So you can use things like, you can actually do separate object detection. So you detect moving uh, boxes and then you can simply uh, uh, recognize these when they come in. So this way you can get significantly higher performance. Uh, and another thing is GPUs. So GPUs are uh, usually better training because the way they operate is they have really long pipelines and they're basically designed for throughput. So if you think about the point, the main purpose of a GPU is to actually render graphics. And in that case, it's more a throughput than a latency game because you have to push millions of pixels on the screen. And you need to do, of course there is a latency constraint, but usually that's soft. For example, nothing really bad happens when a frame is skipped. So there, there are a lot of other methods to actually run neural networks in production. So for example, Google, uh, made a TPU for this exact reason. So the TPU is like a specialized uh, unit for deep networks. It's just a matrix multiplier and you just load your weights and it multiplies things and it's a very, it's a rather short pipeline. So latency wise it's a lot better than a comparable GPU. Another constraint we have is the vehicle simply has uh, compute constraints. If you uh, because we are a small uh, vehicle, we have power constraints uh, most importantly, as well as cost uh, constraints. So if you, for example, we have uh, Titan X on our uh, training machine and that can run yeah, even rather complicated networks really fast. But we will require a lot uh, smaller GPU on the uh, machine just because of both power and cost. And if you think about it, there are a few things you have to optimize when you move to a smaller machine. For example, uh, just basic things like memory and other stuff become more scar scarce. And, and the uh, more th complicated thing is you actually have six cameras. So you need to actually merge them together and process them in real time. So you, al you also realize, quickly realize that 
data transfer is a rather large uh, part of your thing. So you consume a l so you spend a lot you spend a lot of time just transferring data because un uncompressed frames are pretty large. And just on our first prototype, we will be collecting 150 gigabytes an hour just uh, using two cameras. So these also lead to various cha engineering challenges offline in our uh, data center. So for example, you, you will require a petabyte scale uh, storage infrastructure because it's, because it's hard uh, to, act because, you had, because you had 150 GB an hour, you can easily run into petabytes of data over reasonable time period. And another important uh, te technology that you need is the ability to train across multiple GPUs and machines. So usually off the most of the libraries you get are focused on training on maybe one GPU or multiple GPUs inside one machine. But at uh, our scale, you can't uh, really just use one GPU or one machine. Just because you need to use a lot of GPUs and a lot of machines, there are various ways you can actually push data through mul multiple GPUs and multiple machines. And we, we are actually going to collect over 10,000 kilometers of Indian roads to supplement our training with other data sets. So the, the important thing is you have to supplement your training because you just can't train on one uh, da data set because then your network would be, be really tuned to this particular uh, area and it would not be generalized enough that you can just put it on some road and it works. So. Uh, uh, one question that one important thing uh, we found out early was you can find a lot of data very easily on YouTube for example of driving but there are a few issues with those kind of data sets. One important one is quality. So if you think about it there are just so many different cameras capturing data, there are so many different, basically everything, each video is almost a completely different setup. And yeah, and another thing is, uh, even if you get that data, the data may be un unnecessarily, you need to get a lot more data to get as many, to get the same uh, quality network you would do with high quality data. And yeah, and another important thing is, if you, you also need to make sure that you get edge cases, because, uh, because that's where your network will usually fail. We also have a harder problem with our uh, specific use of deep networks. So you, what's bad for us is if we don't detect an obstacle or so, so we need to make, so we may need to make sure that your net, so your network also needs to be self-aware in the, in the sense that, for example, if it thinks that this uh, particular scenario is too confusing for me, I, I think there's something in it that I haven't been trained for. Instead of just reporting nothing, it should say that I don't feel that this scenario is safe given that uh, this is the training I have and you need to be able to transfer control to someone else. So once you put all of this together, you get a robust autonomy stack and we will, and yeah, thank you. We'd like to open the floor to questions. If anyone has one, please raise your hand. We'll bring you a microphone. Uh, hi, one question I have is specifically for this network uh, while driving. Uh, in the training set, you'll find a lot of cases where uh, there'll be shadows and an object, and obstacle is not clearly uh, distinguishable. But how, how are you trying to tackle that, those kind of problems? So the important thing is your data set should be really diverse. So you should have a lot of uh, cases where you have labeled objects that are clearly in shadow or e and the problem is even there. For example, the, si the simplistic road detection methods based on computer vision often get very confused when they see a shadow. So it's important that you have data which includes these uh, scenarios like shadow and even rain and other uh, edge case scenarios. Um, hello, uh, you mentioned LiDAR. Yeah. Uh, so are you planning on implementing that uh, 
migration or is that out in the future? So our light, we actually buy our lighter right now. Hey, uh, so uh, one question like, uh, you need data to uh, basically diverse data. So you need diverse data to uh, make your model robust, right? Yeah. So, but uh, what about uh, those cases where, uh, like, let's say if there is a new model of car coming out or it was coming out or uh, uh, any vehicle or anything which you uh, your model has not seen before. How do you detect those kind of cases? So there are two things in that case. One, because most cars are extremely similar, the model should be robust enough that it just recognizes this as a car, even though it's slightly different than most of the cars in the data set. So, uh, uh, for example, like this uh, Google, uh, uh, Google has this car which does this uh, mapping of uh, different... Yeah, the street view car. Yeah. So it has this weird looking uh, device on the top of it. Uh, Normal car won't be looking like that, but uh, such kind of cases can arise in. Uh, yes, yeah, so that device is actually lidar. Okay. Uh, so uh, my question is basically: so uh, are the model robust by uh, looking at uh, uh, other cars which are already available in the data sets, or? Uh, so yeah. So there are two things actually in that particular case. So one, uh, your model should be robust enough that it actually detects it as a car. If not, you also have multiple sensors for that reason. So for example, your radar will always detect it as a car or your LiDAR will always detect it as a car or some obstacle. Um, a question I had was, you've spoken a lot about detecting objects on the road. Uh, what have you worked on for your navigation algorithms? Because presumably the car will be autonomously navigating from point A to point B and it has to make some decisions along the way. So how do you, how do you train it to make those decisions or, or is that more deterministically programmed? You mean the lowest level, the control level? Um, I actually, I, I think I may have stepped in a couple of minutes late into your talk, so I may have missed that. So if you've gone over that, I can ask you offline. But okay, so the the basic thing is the, the there are a few layers actually. So you have your map, and then from the map, and you have your policy. And once you have decided what you want to do immediately, so for example, you want to stay on this lane, or you want to shift into the next lane, or you want to take a right turn. Then yeah, you do have deterministic algorithms below that layer that actually drive the vehicle. Hi, yeah. Uh, so my question is, uh, can you tell us if this is uh, may being manufactured for the Indian market or abroad? Because the problems that you face, especially in controlling the driving, right? Because driving behavior is very different uh, in India and abroad, and also the infrastructure as well. So existing autonomous vehicles depend a lot on a very specific infrastructure like lane markings, turn signs, stop signs, right? Yeah, so, so the thing is erratic driving is actually uh, the, it's not bad for an autonomous vehicle because usually they can predict behavior better. So that is usually not a problem. The problem is uh, because you don't have lane markings and other stuff, the vehicle can't uh, really decide what to do uh, legally. So for example, if you take a simple case, uh, sometimes you may have a policeman uh, at a manning intersection. So how do you train for that sort of scenario? So for that reason, we are not currently applying to operate on public roads. And we will also be selling overseas, not here. Okay, so you are first tackling the easier problem, that's what you are saying. Because I think like just doing this on Indian roads with traffic is very hard, right? Yeah, so the, the, pro, the, like I said, the problem here is that not the driving part of it, it's just the uh, various perception issues. So for example, if you uh, have a stop, uh, like a stop sign man by a policeman, or you just have, imp you have a lot of implicit things. Like for example, there's no lane usually here. People just stick to the right side and the left side. Yeah. Uh, another question, yeah, okay, so uh, since you, it looks like you are working on some Indian data as well, like detection, segmentation. So most public data sets are not Indian, right? All these, uh, I think Kitty and those vehicle data sets, autonomous vehicle, vehicle data sets. So, you know, like annotating these data sets is very time consuming. So do you put your efforts in that direction or do you like put that aside? So, um, yeah, we are collecting our own Indian data set and yeah, labeling is uh, hard, but you, we use a lot of things. Like for example, you can use a really high quality uh, network to detect, to tag it, and then a human can review it. Okay.
Hey man, I have a bunch of questions. Uh, first question, is your vehicle adaptable to all terrains? Because you said it's a cargo, so I was wondering ki if it can be adapted to non-linear roads, maybe some, some kind of a slope or something. Yeah, so it's actually, uh, it was actually meant for such scenarios. So it uh, has very good off-road uh, support. So it can handle very steep inclines. That's awesome. Okay, and you mentioned Titan X. I believe that's a extremely power demanding computer system. How do you handle that? Yeah, so we don't actually run that on our vehicle. It's only on our uh, server. Oh, right. And your vehicle is fossil fuel based or electric vehicle? It's an uh, electric vehicle. Okay, and one last question. Uh, you, I mean, you'll be tackling a bunch of problems. So for all the problems, are you exclusively dependent on deep learning or you have explored other options as well? We have to use a mix of all options. For, for example, just in vision, we have deep, deep learning. We also have some classical computer vision techniques okay. and various other uh, methods as well. So it's a mix of those. Yeah. Oh. Thanks. Man. Hey, uh, so how does the learning transfer from the simulator to the real world? Do you only use it for policy or do you use it for other things? So we actually can use it for both. So the simulator does have photorealistic graphics. So we can actually use it to train networks as well. In, and we also use it for driving policy. So it's good for creating a lot of uh, scenarios. We can generate a lot of scenarios automatically. You can generate random scenarios. So you can possibly get a wider uh, range of data than you can get in real life. Yeah. Uh, hi there. So um, there are multiple players in this market already, right? Google, Drive.ai, and many of them coming up uh, with their own stack. Uh, so, uh, what do you think is the unique selling point of your um, company, right, as a co-founder? Uh, what do you think you, you plan to do differently to be competitive in this space? So, our vehicle is actually designed from the ground up. So, it's, uh, it's not, we are not, we haven't taken an existing vehicle and uh, made it autonomous because that's making a driverless car is a bit like a horseless carriage. Because you really, because if you think about it after you add autonomy to a vehicle, it completely changes everything. So for example, our vehicle can do zero turning radius. It's uh, completely electric and it can handle uh, a lot of uh, interesting terrain. Right. Okay. Uh, so two years down the lane, uh, what do you think uh, will make you really successful? I mean, in a sense, uh, compared to Google and others, like let's say Uber and others who are in the space. So uh, it's, yeah, so if you think about it, it's mostly, uh, we are a unique vehicle, uh, to put it that way. So uh, for this, uh, uh, it, the inputs will be coming from multiple cameras, I believe? Yeah. So how do you make it like without a time lag, a synchronous input to the network and make a decision? So there are a few things actually. So we use synchronization, uh, hardware synchronization between all the cameras. So we make sure all the frames do come in at exactly the same time. The uh, network uh, will probably, so we have both, uh, we have a few cameras. So most likely all the cameras they fed in as one batch to the network. And then your, your networks do take some latency, but that's, we have like update, uh, we have some time update happen. Hey, what are the sensors and the computing uh, hardware on the vehicle? So we have a LiDAR, we have a radar, a few uh, various cameras and a lot of other smaller sensors. And uh, yeah, we have our, uh, our compute is mostly a, a GPU and yeah, on the way. Right now it's a GPU. Are there any other questions? Going. Going. Okay, great. I see an arm up in the back. Oh no, no, I see a no, that's not me, that's not. Aha! Here's a question and there's one here too. Um, so in conjunction to your simulator, uh, don't you think it might be a good idea to look at uh, 
like very photorealistic multiplayer games which are out there. Uh, let's say Forza Horizon or something like that, where you can somewhat get real human behavior. Yeah, so there are actually a lot of people who do that. So, for example, uh, somebody uh, wrote a deep neural network to uh, r uh, drive a car in GTA. Hi. Uh, do you have a name for your vehicle yet? I'm sorry. Do you have a name for your vehicle yet? Yeah, we internally call it the mule. Are there any other questions? All right, then. We're done. Saad, thank you so much. I think the future is going to be very interesting.